Welcome to Decoding Superhuman. This show is a deep dive into obsessions with health, performance, and how to elevate the human experience. I explore the latest tools, science, and technology with experts in various fields of human optimization. This is your host, Boomer Boomer Anderson. Anderson. Enjoy the journey. All right, superhumans, it's Boomer, and we are back with another first-time episode or first-time topic on the Decoding Superhuman podcast. So today, we're going to get a little bit into, actually very deep into, the oral microbiome. But before that, I want to talk a little about my past week because I've floated back and forth from London, first time post-Brexit, and had a great time with this fantastic community of health optimization people in London at the first really biohacking congress. And one of those guests or co-speakers there happened to be among the cohort of people that introduced me to today's podcast guest. But before we get into today's podcast guest, let's talk about the iTunes reviews because we picked up another couple of five-star iTunes reviews this week. And I want to give a shout out to one in particular, and this is from Mark Rio, Mark Adot Rio. Subject, great show. It's like having a health coach in your pocket. Boomer does a fantastic job breaking down complex topics. Thank you, Mark. Because he's based in Amsterdam, he has great guests from all around the world. This is my go-to performance podcast. Well, I really appreciate all the shout outs, guys. And if you want to head over to iTunes and leave a five star review, I probably will read yours pretty soon on the show as well. But Mark Rio, thank you so much for the shout out. All right, so today we're going to get into the oral microbiome. And as I mentioned, I have to give a shout out to both Dr. Scott Schur as well as Tim Gray for the introduction to today's podcast guest. And it is Dr. Dominic Nieschwitz. He is a dentist and naturopath specializing in biological dentistry and ceramic implants. He's also the president of the International Society of Metal Free Implantology. If all of that seems just confusing to you, stick around for the podcast because we delve into these topics in detail. Dr. Nieschwitz co-founded DNA Health and Aesthetic Center for Biological Dentistry in Germany in 2015. He regularly lectures around the world, and his new book, It's All in Your Mouth, which I have read, will be published through Chelsea Green on March 18th, 2020. So actually, you guys may be able to pick it up shortly after this podcast is released. In addition to his surgical work, Dom's passion for the last 15 years has been optimal health and performance, nutrition, and competitive sports. Similar to me, we both have an obsession with performance and kind of fell into this world of biohacking by accident. Dr. Dom and I go into many different topics in detail and really start to unpack a lot of the things that we think about when it comes to biological dentistry. When I was growing up, it was always common that if you had a cavity, you get a filling. Get a filling. If you had a issue with your tooth, you get a root canal. I had my, like so many other Americans, had my wisdom teeth removed at the rightful age of 18. And Dr. Dom takes the time today to really break down why those processes that we went through and didn't question may actually be affecting our health today. We get deep into the oral microbiome, the problems with root canals, amalgams, and the association with mercury, as well as why all of health may actually begin in your mouth. The show notes for this one are decodingsuperhuman.com slash D-R-D-O-M-E, and enjoy my conversation with Dr. Dominic Nieschwitz. Dr. Dom, welcome. Hey, Buma, thank you for having me. So this is a decoding superhuman first. Our mutual friend, Tim Gray, came on the show, I don't know, about six months ago, actually, to talk briefly about Mercury. But we haven't really done the the deep dive that is necessary into the oral microbiome. So got a big task at hand today. <laughs> Thank you. Sounds amazing. There's a number of questions that I and some of our listeners want 
to ask of you. But first, and seeing this on your wall brings up this question and also just a general personal interest. Where does skateboarding come into play? Yeah, skateboarding is basically what shaped me. So I would say I'm still a skater at heart. But I started back in 1995 and was 12 years old. And I've just seen a music video from Joe Cocker where somebody did an ollie. And I thought it's just cool and asked my dad if he can buy a skateboard. And then we, he went and we bought one. And basically skateboarding was dead in 1995. So I had to do that in front of my home, like on the street. And yeah, tried to learn it myself. So very intrinsically motivated. And of course, the whole lifestyle that came with it, like baggy pants, being individuals. So I had long blonde hair, long blonde dreadlocks when I was 12 years old. So my, yeah, I will send you a picture. I had my pants... <laughs> My, parents were, my, uh, my baggy pants back then, they were cut off at the widest um, part. So they only were like super short. So I had to wear them below my butt, basically. So they, and then they still just went right above the shoes. So really looked like, yeah, for my mom, it looked really weird. So, but I like the style and the street credibilities. And of course, the hip hop, rap, music, rap, all these things, Wu-Tang Clan and graffiti, the whole... The whole thing appealed to me. You just, you just said the magic words of Wu-Tang Clan. I know we're going to get along now. <laughs> Wu-Tang Clan, if you would see this here, right there, this is, I can show you later. This is my little 30-year, um, yeah, kind of like a wall of fame where everything is in there. And awesome. Skateboarding, ba- skateboarding basically, um, yeah, I like to do things that nobody, nobody should tell me something, probably, and I like to learn it myself and like the challenges. And skateboarding basically trained me to do like yeah fall back up fall back up because there's no literally was nobody to teach me i had to have like a little magazine and then Mm -hmm. go to the lens and see how maybe a kickflip works so i learned that all by trying 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 fall try fall so failure is not an option here so yeah it's just always learning right I, i recall i wasn't a skateboarder per se but i was on the rollerblades and you go and do something crazy on the rail and bust yourself. It's not like the day is over. You just keep on going, right? <laughs> of course, you try until you land it. Yep, exactly. Exactly. So today, again, there's so many questions that we're going to go through here. And I want to just touch a little bit. Let's just go into the oral microbiome because there's something that you say in your book, and we'll get to the book later, about how the oral microbiome and the oh so popular gut microbiome are really indistinguishable do you mind going into what that actually means a bit it's actually pretty logic because uh, yeah the mouth is kind of like the entrance to your whole system mm-hmm. uh, yeah you can imagine basically kind of like a worm going through your body it starts with your mouth and it ends with the behind you know what i mean mm-hmm. and of course, and you talk about the whole gut system which basically Like what we're talking about is mostly starting with the stomach, small intestine, large intestine, and the rear end. But the entrance is your mouth. And if you see it from like an evolutionary point of view, when you go go through the womb, the first thing in contact for the microbiome is your mouth getting the vaginal flora microbiome and then like basically breastfeeding. So the first initial contact with a microbiome is always the mouth. And then you see little babies. They, they cannot see, they do nothing. They're only with their mouth. They have to test everything and stuff, everything into their, into their mouth. And you know, from research nowadays, we know that the microbiome will change within three days, depending on your um, diet, lifestyle. But also, of course, if you breastfed, it's a total different microbiome. Or if you came through the world through a cesarean section, it's a total different microbiome than if you get the regular birth. Mm-hmm. So yeah, everything starts in the mouth. And this is why we... Yeah, it's kind of like the mirror for your overall health. So leaky gut is a big thing. I would say leaky gum is even before that. And the microbiome in your mouth is way more diversified than the microbiome at the rear end, which makes total sense because the mouth has to control everything. There's a huge immune system. And basically, you know, your immune system is there to attack foreign invaders, proteins and stuff. And of course, initial contact has to help here. So we have a microbiome which is containing an immune system. Of course, all the, all the digestion will start there too, with the, saliva, with the saliva and stuff. So I would say it's at least fourfold um, higher than the microbiome at the end. 
Mm -hmm. so it's literally very diversified and it changes. So um, if you, for example, have some things installed later on because you have dental work done, for example, melanin fillings, they will totally disrupt your whole microbiome in your mouth already. And of course, then further down in your gut, it's the same thing. And there's a lots of research showing that when you have melanin filling at one time, mercury is the most toxic non-radioactive uh, element on earth. Mercury kills the good bacteria and attracts other bacteria or other micro, bio, micro, mm -hmm. microbiotics, like, for example, viruses and parasites. So it's, it's getting shifted into a dysbiosis model, for example. It's just one example. Yeah. So, Dr. Dom, one of the things uh, that you mentioned there was this concept of leaky mouth. Now, leaky gut, I think, has got a lot, or leaky gum, I think you used was the word. Leaky gut has got a lot of publicity, leaky gum, a little bit less so. Is there a way for us to define, or I, I don't want to use the D word of diagnose, but able to assess what exactly is leaky gum? So leaky gum, basically, just see like this, your, your skin is a protection, the outside skin and the gingiva here, the, the red, your skin in, in your mouth is called gingiva, mm -hmm. is also outside, outside body. Also like the same as the mucosa in your gut system, it's outside body. And if that gets inflamed due to stressors, for example, wrong uh, diet, etc., or maybe different metals, like it just gets inflamed or wounds come in there, you get an opening into the system already in your mouth. So it's the same as leaky gut, but just more up there. So if the gingiva is, it should be like, if you just not diagnose it, but if you just look in the mouth of a patient, the gingiva should be like not swollen. It should be not super red. So the opposite of everything that like kind of like tight, a little bit of pinkish, no bleeding at all. And so it should be super tight attached to your, your teeth. It's actually called the attached gingiva. It would show you, you would see there's an attached part of the gingiva, which is stable. You cannot move it. And then if you, if you pull a little bit above, there will be a line, which then changes to the mucosa, which is movable. But the attached part is basically this, the thing that protects the whole inside body. Same as the gut lining here. So it's like the tight junctions in the gut, if I have that right. Yeah, it's totally the same concept. It's not maybe not with the zonalines and stuff, but of course, if you have an inflammation and the attachment gets loose, so if it goes further down, you get periodontitis, which means you have an inflammation already in your periodontium, which is the bone structure around the tooth or like the, the stuff around the tooth mm -hmm. hanging in there, then it's already an opening to your whole system. So bacteria that anyways lives in your body and in your mouth, which is not a problem because you basically we are 2% human DNA around about and 98% is microbial, um, microbial DNA or foreign DNA. Mm -hmm. so if there's no opening and everything is fine and, and in balance, no problem. But if it's now inflamed, and we have kind of like a huge opening for anaerobics, for example, or viruses, then they can just go into your system initially from your mouth. So it's basically the same. And, and if you have a healthy mouth, let's say you've never been to the dentist, you clean perfectly, the gingiva is amazing, amazing attached gingiva, no bleeding at all, then it's no problem. But if you had the filling done, you have the tooth is not the same tooth anymore. It's not healthy because from a reparation or maintenance point of view, you can bite on it, but it's still different. So maybe you have a, met a metal filling or maybe a crown work. It changes. If the crown, for example, has metal underneath, you will always see clinically. If I look into your mouth, and I can totally see where you have a metal crown because then the attached gingiva will not be as healthy anymore. It will be more red, a little bit swollen. It will bleed all the time, like chronically, and, have, and it will be a little bit away from the tooth. So there will be always an opening. Same with root canals. Mm -hmm. Or whatever you bring in from the outside that disturbs the system. So it's uh, big so you uh, you struck on a, a few things there that I want to elaborate on quite a bit. But if I were to extrapolate just a broader message for people, and it's something that you mentioned in your book, is that that low grade chronic inflammation that we see as the hallmark of all disease. It, I mean, it kind of has its its root, pardon the pun, uh, in our mouth. Do I have that right? Yes, not with everybody, but 
let's say from a different point of view, I had good mentors. One of them was is still Dietrich Klingert. Maybe you're familiar yeah. with him. Yeah, very. But yeah, and I've also worked at Paracelsus Clinic in Switzerland, whereas Thomas Rao, you maybe heard of him. So mm-hmm. I had a lot of great mentors. And from their perspective, being integrative medical doctors, 70% of all chronic disease starts in your mouth. So that's a lot. Yeah. And yeah. this is somebody, this is something nobody addresses. And I think me being also a naturopathic doctor and f- trained in functional medicine or just a health nerd, basically. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I, I want to tell this to all the other colleagues because of course, Dietrich looks at this and sends patients over and we work in this field. But still, if you listen to a lot of podcasts, this, in, this part is just missing. Kind of like, so kind of like in university, you just, or like in hangover, you just the dentist. You're not a doctor. You're basically just repairing people's mouths so that they can buy it. And this is the problem here. We're trained in university to basically have a super high craftsman, high tech skills, which is super important. This is the basic for everything. But the missing part here is that it is the mirror for your overall health. And it's actually not outside body, it's inside body. So Mm -hmm. we need to look at this very particular and the good thing is, if you see it that way, and it's just a little bit more knowledge, you can actually help people getting healthy again. And this is the fun part. Of course, the craftsman part is amazing, and you can achieve awesome stuff, kind of like building Lego, but very difficult. Uh, but on, if your patients tell you on the next day, okay, I was chronically depressed, I had super high TNF alpha, chronic inflammation, I couldn't sleep, etc. You mention it, and 80% is all gone already. Then you, that's the fulfilling part, and you don't work you, one day in your life anymore because you're just helping people. This was the part that was, was missing for me in university. I didn't know yeah. that, but you see, it's just we just have to add in the whole body. And of course, all sciences are also applicable in your mouth. And a little bit is the FDA. The FDA still kind of um, clarifies or like the fillings, the stuff you put into your mouth, are kind of not in your body, but they lay on top of your teeth outside of the body kind of like devices so you don't have to that's how they how they did, did this so you kind of not have to totally yeah evaluate toxicology and all these problems because you're installing things just for the purpose of biting which is just function root canals it's a pain treatment and of course you can bite on a root canal tooth no problem and it's also difficult therapy but is it from an optimal health point of view does it make you healthier or is it not a good idea to leave a dead body in you in your that organ in your body you know what i mean i i do and i think this is a great light that you're shining on something because when i was going to the dentist growing up uh, as you can imagine because i know you've seen my x-rays uh i had an interesting experience whereby it was a lot of just repair and leave repair and leave come for your six month checkup but it was never about optimizing my health and this is what i I think drew me to you and your work is that you're looking at the whole picture now uh, dr dom what i want to do is uh, next i want to have kind of a choose your own path and we can go down a few different topics but i want you to pick which one we go down first Uh, either we can go down the cavities and the amalgams route uh, wisdom teeth or uh, perhaps you know, even, well, I guess ca- cavities and amalgams would be, I guess crowns, that would be one that I'd also like to talk about as well. Uh, so crowns, wisdom teeth, or cavities and amalgams, which way would you like to go first? Yeah, I would say we can, we could start with the three, three challenges at all. So we can see, okay, there are different challenges in your mouth from a maintenance point of view and repairing protocol, which is metals that overall, it could be <laughs> fillings, crown work, partial grounds. Amalgam, gold, whatever. Then we could do the second one, which would be root canals from a biological point of view. Oh, and of sure. course, then the one thing is cavitations or fatty degenerative osteonecrotic jawbone, which is still not accepted in medical school, unfortunately, even if there's a lot of research. So I would do all three challenges and basically maybe start with the definition of biological dentistry from my sure, point of view. Sure. Let's, Let's do that. that. So I, I kind of explained how you get trained in university, that you, of course, you learn all the sciences. But it's not really applicable. It's more like, like you said, repair the patients. You're being a garage later. You have to go to see the dentist because you have a pain and then you want to bite again. And of course, everybody hates the dentist because of this, because it's mostly pain treatment. And our focus is the opposite. We, for us, it's more like we're searching for your optimal health, but we're looking at your mouth as the mirror for overall health. And basically what you can say is 
Biologic dentistry, in my point of view, is the overlap of functional medicine, maybe biohacking, and high-tech dentistry. So it's more like the next level, and it doesn't go against school medicine. It just adds in all the other things, even if it's Ayurvedic medicine, Chinese medicine, whatever you can do to optimize the health. So first challenge, you just stop. Do you want me to just, just go on? Just keep going. I, I go with the first challenge. Yeah, I'm able to speak like for hours. That's why <laughs> I'll interrupt you and ask follow on questions as I have them. Cool. So the first challenge will be metals in your mouth. Yeah. 20 years ago, no problem in terms of um, biting in the 80s. Yeah, there, there was this in the early 90s, there was the first discussion about amalgams. So amalgam is always a little bit critical because it's still used. Amalgam from a dental point of view is a super material. It lasts forever. It's easy to perform. And it kills all the bacteria. That's what you learn in university. What you don't learn is that 50% of amalgam is mercury. And what you learn after university is that if you remove an amalgam filling from the mouth of a patient, you have to, you, uh, you have to um, put it away as highly toxic stuff. So somebody has to come in and pick it up. So this was the first thought process I had. So why I cannot put somebody uh, something in the mouth of anybody which is super toxic, makes no sense. And on the other hand, from my personal perspective, I just thought a black filling is super ugly. We have this. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's From an aesthetic point of view, it's just ugly. And my dad is a dentist too. I'm working with him at the clinic. And he, I knew that he didn't do amalgam since the early 90s. And I heard it was kind of toxic. And for me, this was also the entrance in the whole field because I was learning everything to help to optimize my health for about 20 years now, since I'm 16, 17 years old. And because I told my first boss then, I won't do amalgam fillings, I think they're ugly, I had to know a little bit more about this. And this was when the whole concept opened and when I first met, uh, met um, Dietrich. Mm -hmm. I've never placed any amalgam fillings, but I removed them on the safe uh, precaution. So the amalgam part is the one thing. Dr. Dom, can we go into that removal? Because I've had removal of amalgam fillings before, and I'm almost certain that it wasn't done in a quote-unquote safe way. What does exactly that safe way look like? Yeah, so at the beginning of my career, like in dentistry, I just, of course, I thought amalgam filling removal will be, will be the holy grail. I will be able to help every patient getting healthy again. And of course, I used all safe removal measurements, which is, of course, a rubber dam. But the rubber dam is just a protection in for the pieces so that they don't fall in your mouth and don't swallow the big pieces. The most problematic is always the murky vapor. So if you grind on your teeth or you chew or whatever, you will always release a little bit of mercury vapor, which is about two to three micrograms, almost nothing. And the vapor, of course, you can't see, you can't smell, but the vapor goes through everything, even through six layers of, um, what is it, like hand? Skin. Yeah, yeah, you know, like the, the, yeah. The, the latex gloves, those kind of things? You use six, yeah, latex wow. gloves. And does, it goes just straight through into your cell and will be catalyzed by enzymes and then stuck there. So that's one thing, just rubber dam. Then we use a different um, suction. It's called Cleanup. It's from Sweden. It's kind of it goes over your tooth and has this. Uh, it spins, so it will suck up a lot of the mercury vapor. Mm -hmm. so we'll try to not drill at all, and with a lot of water. It's depending on the size of the mercury, but if it's a big one, we can go around because we anyways maybe do a partial crown. So we break it out, so that we don't even do any vapor. And we have a big machine, which is kind of like a huge. Um, yeah, it looks like a huge oven and it pulls 99.9% .9 of all the vapor in it suck it's a big suction device. You can, it's called IQ Air. Yeah. Also help us as the dentist and of course the patients. Also the patient will get a nasal probe where we will um, apply just um, just regular oxygen. And when we have taken out uh, the melon filling, we will put a chlorella paste just into the cavity to bind what's left in the dental tubules, leave it there for three minutes, and then we most of the time place just a temporary filling to help the tooth and um, detox itself even further. Mm -hmm. And that's, and of course, and we as dentists, we will wear a mask, in German it's called FFP3, I don't know what you call it in English, it's just a mask that just protects yourself about 99% of the mercury vapor. Mm -hmm. I didn't do that at the beginning. That was my fault. I just oh. did everything for the patient, but basically intoxicated me big time because, of course, 
I told my boss, I will remove all amalgam fillings and I place composite fillings and ceramics and I will help my patients with this. And he's like, okay, this is something you have to believe. You're Protestant, I'm a Catholic, so that was his opinion. But he let me do it. And yeah, of course, what I didn't know is that, didn't notice this wasn't a good idea for me. So my work was raised immensely. Yeah. So it made me a little bit more uncomfortable here, like a little bit sicker. But now I know how it works. So you can learn all these things. But this is just a toxic part of, of, of you. Like amalgam is just not a good thing. It's not aesthetic, of course. And of course, it's super toxic. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of, like Russia, for example, has no amalgam fillings for 30 years. All the Scandinavian countries banned it around about 2009 because they basically didn't, like, they did a mercury a law against mercury in the whole country. So you could, you cannot place it in the mouth of people. It's not against the amalgam, it's just like mercury in general is forbidden. So it's not existing anymore. And still, to this day, the biggest source of mercury intoxication is your amalgam filling. Yeah. Don't do the fall and go to anybody and just rip it out because if you do a regular, the normal dentist will just drill it out and then you will have way more mercury uh, vapor and stuff in your body than by just having the amalgam filling in your mouth in the first place. So I've seen a lot of chronic sick patients becoming sick because of a wrong removal. So if you can't find somebody to remove it, leave it in there and search for the safe removal. That's one caveat. Okay. Um, one thing I've heard from, from others, and I just want to bounce this by you, is the connection between amalgam fillings, mercury, and just kind of candida. Is there one? Uh, can, we, can we delve into that a little bit? Yeah, candida just... This is basically the... the so the explanation for this is that they, they like the new environment with heavy metals. They use it. It's not just candida. It's also parasites. Mm -hmm. they, they kind of like eat that stuff. They use it for, for building biofilms, etc. So it's more like a dysbiosis followed by mercury intoxication. And it's also probably because of the wrong, uh, because of a dysbiosis, because mercury kills the good bacteria. So it's a double whammy. So your immune system will be a little bit disrupted. The biofilm, you call it, so these, these, micro, these microbes, let's just call them microbes, they mm -hmm. organize themselves in, in little towns and houses, and that's called the biofilm. That's it everywhere. You know the biofilm on your teeth if you have this little fur on top of your teeth, because you can mm -hmm. pokes and stuff, but the biofilm goes further. It will be within fascia, it will be like almost everywhere is microbes, which is not a big problem. But if it's the wrong ones, like anaerobics or maybe viruses, like, like candida, and they will also use the metal. I can just picture it like they build houses and make their steel, make it like just more indestructible. You know mm -hmm. what? I mean? They build their biofilms a little, more extreme, a little bit more extreme. And parasites, you know that from Dietrich's research, um, that they just eat it up and, you will, and they will in, integrate it into, into their whole system. So mm -hmm. they kind of help coming to help you detox yourself from all these things. But of course, they come for a price. They want your energy. They're parasites. So um, it's a big problem. So we, that's why you always would, if you do any sort of detoxification protocol, after you have um, removed the whole source from your body, first things first, so if you have if you have, if no metal anymore, you will, of course, follow up with, the, for example, a testing. Do you have still any intracellular mercury, which is quite common, of course, because you maybe had the amalgam for 20 years. Mm -hmm. Always nowadays, not just detox heavy metals, we will always address chronic infections, parasites, and microbes altogether. It's just a basic rule of thumb. And what you normally never do, this is something that Hal Huggins said, you will never start a big detoxification, for example, a chelation therapy, while you're having the sauce in your mouth. This would be like showering, yeah, and trying to. to um, dry yourself at the same time. This is classic Hal Huggins, one of the first mm -hmm. logic dentists. He actually died like two years ago, three years ago, and he was one of the biggest pioneers. But it makes sense. And still, to this day, even good integrative medical doctors I see, they, they start, of course, what they know, and then they will do, then of course they measure the heavy metals, but they didn't look into the mouth. And of course, there's the root source, and you cannot do a big chelation protocol while still having the source in there. Just That's just basic log logic, right? Yeah. I mean, guys, you can see me laughing because I, when I tried to do this several years ago, the first the first step was the heavy metal chelation. And then I was like, oh, shit, while well, the the actual source is still there. Um, so 
I can see how this is working very well. This is a big takeaway here that you always have to address the source first. Mm -hmm. You can build up your body. That's what we always do. We, we improve your liver phase one, phase two. We use macronutrients, micronutrients, the whole lifestyle. And then, of course, we remove everything. Also, all the other metals are nowadays a little bit more problematic because we now just talked about toxicology. So mercury is just toxic by itself. It depends on your individual ability to detox and compensate. But of course, from an optimal point of view, I wouldn't want to have it in my body because mm -hmm. I have to detox it. But the other part is always the immune system. So your immune system, if it gets allergic, and the immune system can become allergic to everything, even to gold, to mercury, whatever, if it, or nickel, if it gets allergic, it's not dose dependent anymore. So like a little bit of it you can get a full immune reaction every day, ongoing, chronically, and it costs a lot of energy and makes you chronically sick on the other side. And the mm -hmm. third part is nowadays, if you would be not allergic to titanium, not to gold, not to mercury, not to nothing, and also you can, you're a perfect detoxer. There's one big thing, and this is, I hope, I'm looking forward to Dr. McCullough's book coming out on EMF, is EMF. Because if you have Wi-Fi, and now it's 4G, and now it's 5G in bigger towns already, and so electromagnetic wave fields will interfere with every metal in your body. It doesn't matter if it's the titanium hip or the titanium implant, or the gold crown, there will be a little bit of an antenna. Normally, if you have a phone call, it, the electromagnetic waves go to your, uh, to your cell phone and back to the tower. If you have any metal elsewhere in your body installed, it will go to the metal, amplifies that uh, up until 400 to 700 fold, and of course disrupts your whole autonomic nervous system. Mm -hmm. Titanium implant, we know that a 4G will heat up the area around a titanium implant up until three to four degrees Celsius. This is high fever. Wow. Wow, wow yes. And and with 5G, I don't even know what will happen, but it's probably 5G means it's just exponentially more. So 2.45 gigahertz will then be 4.8 probably. So just higher frequencies will in medical point in medical terms always um, increase the problem exponentially. Mm -hmm. So you'll never know, but you always have to see that the electromagnetic field is a big thing, and of course, corrosion, salivary. So we have the galvanic problem, we have toxicology, immunology, and EMFs, just with the metals. So of course, it's a no-brainer for us in biological dentistry. We have everything metal-free. And as I'm a surgeon, I'm specializing in ceramic implants and have placed over 3,000 pieces nowadays. Mm -hmm. This is also from the just strictly technical side of you, dental side of you. Please. A lot of things I've done already is like in terms of, yeah, so we are able nowadays, I'm very lucky, we can install things that are 100% biocompatible, neutral, no free electrons, and actually healing stones that help your body prosper or get to optimal health. So you don't have to rip out anything and then just leave it like this. Like now we have solutions. So let's go back to that idea on EMF because, and then we'll transition over some of these other topics, but uh, EMF and 5G is a, a topic that we've tried to cover a few times on this podcast and is the idea that essentially it's, for lack of a better term, uh, wherever the, it, whether it's coming from a cell phone tower, your Wi-Fi, et cetera, the metal in our bodies uh, just magnifies it by a certain extent. And then what is, is the repercussions only to our autom autonomic nervous system, which in itself is significant, or is it to other areas as well? I think it's to all areas possible. Like just the cell by itself has a, has a, there's a current in your body all the time. Yeah. You know how the pumps work, the electron pumps, it's always mm -hmm. microcurrents kind of. And the, the um, what is it, the electromagnetic wave is, the wavelength, if it's wrongly translated, I'm a German guy, so. Oh, that's fine. It's 2.45 gigahertz normally, mm -hmm. and this is the same frequency our body works. So mm -hmm. you basically mm -hmm. manipulate um, a little bit of the DNA by, while being into this all and um, yeah, go against your your own chaotic um, frequencies. So earlier days, let's say 100 years ago, there were so many frequencies nature used that we could align ourselves to. Yeah. Nowadays, it's all blocked because we have not just Wi-Fi, 5G, 4G. We also have all these like things that are used by the government, by the military. I don't even know which frequencies are. <laughs> like all frequencies are already used up. 
and they interfere. And if you go into your home, so my clinic and my home is all, there was a building biologist and take care of it 10 years ago so that I know that my environment is fine. So I don't have any Wi-Fi installed. I can, I can switch it on if I need it real quick. But for example, here's a landline and mostly my iPhone is in airplane mode. And it's also all my patients and my staff will have airplane mode. So we're pretty big on this to go back as much as possible into, into nature to avoid this. Or maybe, so I'm a big fan of, of the new, new techniques, or of the new things. Like I like that real cyborgs having an, an iPhone and our extended brains. I like all this. But of course, you have to know how to use it because it's really, or even if it's convenient, it's really not good for your health. And you never know what happens because... You, you and me, we kind of the same age. So I grew up without, an, without a cell phone. My first yeah. phone, I was 18 years old. My first computer, I was 21 years old. Imagine. Wow. How did you get away with the first computer at 21 years old? Yeah, because I didn't know anything about computers. I was just skating. <laughs> I'm, a super, I'm more like an extremist. If I do something, I do this like super focused kind of autistically and be only focused on this and everything else around me just disappears. Same. Now I'm... I wanted to become a professional doctor and help people, so it's the same focus. Yeah? And yeah, we just have to know you how to use it, the smartphone, but use it smart in terms of health. So of course, no Wi-Fi at, at night times is a no-brainer, but still a lot of patients or people out there, they just sleep with this next to here, and it's not an airplane mode, it's on, and it will interfere. If you bring a, I don't know the word in English, you could bring a meter to measure, yeah. is it a meter? Yeah, you can get an RF or an EMR meter, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and then you can make the Wi-Fi sound, uh, so, um, a sound to it. And it's like this. And of course, this interferes with your whole system the whole night. You can go into deep sleep perfectly. So you cannot detox anymore because you're in chronic stress. So basically, everything we need to find nowadays, and this is my point of view also from biohacking world, we just we managed to change our environment to an inhuman one over the last 100 years. So... Uh, it's really difficult for us. So we have to find ways and solutions to go back to nature. And even more so if all these new things technically come into place. So that's why, of course, you have to do a cold plunge. Mm -hmm. Because you don't live in nature anymore next to a nice river. Of course, you have to go and find sun because you most, most of the times you're inside, indoors. You don't have any sun. So you need vitamin D3 maybe. And of course, red light will help you. And of course... Um, we, you need everything to to go back to nature, and the same applies to your mouth. Mm -hmm. Of course, from an if marketing was be, would be the idea, yeah, to be to be maybe terminated would be a nice idea to have an endoscopic skeleton which is full of matter. Um, yeah, of course, all these things will bring you into chronic sympathetic autonomic nervous system, so you're in fight and flight all day long. So basically. Mm -hmm. Wherever you can find solutions to go back with nature or in nature or use natural things, and now you have to use them technically. So, you use, the, of course, I have a red light panel here in the back, and I use all the things in my clinic, but actually, only because we managed to go off the human, um, I don't know the word in English, but off uh, like. Uh, so far away from humanity as it was, uh, it, we've gone away from ancestral norms and thought that all of a sudden we can catch up and like this fast. And in reality, this meat suit that we live in has been built over hundreds of thousands of generations, right? <laughs> and all, yeah, and you see, only for twenty years, maybe maximum, maybe it's only ten years. There's Wi-Fi before mm -hmm. it's always landline. So and it's kind of like a big experiment, and nobody knows what will happen. But yeah. what's sure is that what, what worked in the 80s or in the 90s, like having metals to bite on it, was probably not a big deal. But now it's not. It's totally different. So titanium implants are there. For, so implants are things that uh, you can install if you have lost a tooth. They're mostly, they're mostly from, made from titanium. And titanium is kind of not, not extremely allergic. But nowadays it's getting more and more allergies for titanium. And, of course, we have this antenna. Yeah. And that's why we need ceramic counterparts or things that are just biocompatible and neutral. And yeah, let's just say if we look at the, um, in the to the stress axis, which is basically hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal glands, yeah. everything that chronically disrupts this 
if it's your lifestyle, the EMFs, the chronic infections, the toxins, the stuff installed in your mouth, all these things um, will add up as a burden or and your body will, of course, get into problems. And nowadays, epidemic, epidemic from my medical point of view, is always um, the chronic disease is our epidemic of the 20th century. So we need different solutions nowadays, and metals are not acceptable anymore. And root canals would be the next challenge, maybe, to go to the next right. level. Let's um let's go through that. Just one real quick question before we go through. Is ceramic the answer for crowns and all of these in terms of if we need to have those procedures done? So I wouldn't say that's the ultimate an- answer, but nowadays we have the possibility to use ceramics even as a new tool as an implant, ceramic implant. And if it's done by, for example, zirconium dioxide, is 100% neutral and... They also use it in spacecrafts and stuff, and the possibility is there. I don't, I'm not saying that this will be the final word because maybe there will be better ideas, but for now I would say, okay, ceramics is something 100% natural. You shouldn't use ceramics that are like con- are containing any kind of metal oxide to, yeah. to make them look different or have a different shape, but if it's just a pure, for example, pure zirconium dioxide implant, which I'm using is perfect, and of course, there are different um, ceramic versions for partial crowns, for full crowns. You can use lithium di- disilicate, um, porcelain. You can use that's just materials. But yes, let's say in overall terms, ceramics are neutral and biocompatible. Okay. So we so, can install that stuff. Moving on to the root canal, I had one when I was 20. I didn't like going through the procedure as it is. And I'm pretty sure that the guy that did it was not a biological dentist. What are the problems with that come with having a root canal in general? So sometimes you just need that swift kick in the butt, but other times you really are looking for total cell optimization. And when we look at total cell optimization, we're talking about things like NAD and all these super, super hot topics. One of my go-to resources for most nootropics is Neurohacker. And Neurohacker has come up with one of my favorite formulations, which was the original stack, but they've continued to progress and push the innovation over the years. One of their latest is Eternus, which is all about cell optimization. You can head over to neurohacker.com and use the code BOOMER because, frankly, you'll get a really good discount of 15% off of a subscription or 10% off your original purchase. That's neurohacker.com. BOOMER is your discount code. And back to the episode. So, yeah. As you said, you needed it probably because you had pain, a big cavity, whatever. And then, of course, the the dentist wanted to save the tooth just for biting reasons. And, of mm-hmm. course, a, like you said, the procedure in itself is pretty painful. That's why a lot of patients hate the dentist. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, but it will help you go over the initial pain. And that's also something we would do. We would use it as a temporary just to get you off pain when it's already like when you had already that big cavity. Of course, mm-hmm. it's your best idea to don't even get cavities at all. Yeah. Then, from a medical point of view, normally a tooth, and this is something you maybe have to picture, I will send you a picture later, the, the teeth are 32 organs, if you have all the wisdom tooths in your, in your mouth. 32 organs that are kind of like totally super close to your brain, and they're all attached or the end of one big nerve, which is the trigeminal nerve. The trigeminal nerve is one of 12 brain nerves that, that start in the brain stem, and the trigeminal nerve needs 50% of the space there. So it might be very interesting for your body to keep this. And these teeth are at the end of it. So the tooth is a living organ in itself. It has a blood supply, it has a lymph supply, and a nervous system. That's the definition of an, of, of an organ. Same as the stomach or the liver or the large intestine. If you now see the tooth, the teeth, yeah, and just for biting because it's hard stuff that doesn't grow anymore. Of course, you can work with this, but the root canal basically goes into the pulp. The pulp is the, the internal part where there's the blood supply, the lymph supply, etc. And the root canal will take this part out of your out of your um, out of your tooth because then the pain is gone. And then we'll clean it. And then use some things to fill it up and place some good to make it last. This is what you see on the on the X-ray. These whites, 
these white lines in, in your roots. Mm -hmm. Thomas here, and there are studies showing this. If you have a, so it's again, the same things, immunology, toxicology, uh, material problems, and the whole organ problem that it's not, that it's not living anymore. So you take out the, the blood supply, then there are studies showing that you don't have any immune system there anymore. So if you had any kind of invaders that are coming to the periodontium or to the dental tubules and wanted to go into your pulp when it's still living, your immune system will just take care of these bacteria and stuff. But if there is no immune system anymore, of course, these bacteria that anyways in your system, the microbiome, will go in there and, kind of, and it will kind of act like a big cave for microorganisms. Dietrich Klingert would say a compartment. This is how all these micro, microbes um, organize themselves. They look for things they can lurk in and overproduce and colonize. So anaerobic bacteria are anyways in your, in your system. But if they go in there and live there because they can live without um, oxygen, then of course you will have a compartment and have more anaerobic bacteria there. So you will have a chronic infection over time. This is just normal basic science. It's kind of like I explain it to patients like this. Okay, you have this root, you have these little tiny dental tubules where these mouses are in, which are the microbes, and the cat, which is the immune system, is just around the hole and tries to catch it all the time. So if you have a good immune system, you will end up having a low-dose inflammation there, which maybe presents as a cyst underneath the tooth, uh, apical periodontitis or whatever. Mm -hmm. And this is just the basic your immune system t trying to protect itself. And it normally does it. It's your innate immune system. It does it by macrophage-activated phagocytosis. That means it will produce um, pro-inflammatory cytokines. Yeah which is TNF-alpha, interleukin-1 beta, NF-kappa B, uh, IL-6, etc., which are, of course, locally problematic, but also over time, this is a thing, it's getting chronic, will, um, will work systemically. So this is the immune part of you. So toxic immune system, bacterial load, chronic infection, and, of course, chronic inflammation. Also, the things we use just from a mechanical point of view to, to put into the root canal, which is gutta-percha, colophonium, Lots of different things, also metal containing, could be in itself allergenic. Yeah, so you could also get an allergy to the gutta percha used in there, and also the dental tubules in one root. That's again with the in one root is about one kilometer of length or 0.6 miles in length, where all these bacteria can lurk. And just by cleaning the big channel, you're not able to clean or disinfect these dental tubules. At least not over time. Maybe a good root canal specialist is able to disinfect it. It will maybe use ozone, whatever. But over time, because it's a, the case pr principle, you will have all these bacteria that are living with you going back into the into the system, yeah. already in there and overproduced. And also these bacteria, they also live there, so they will produce their metabolites. And these mm -hmm. metabolites, they produce them out of the amino acids you anyways eat. So it's mostly the sulfur-containing amino acids like cysteine, methionine, that they use to build their metabolites, and they are highly toxic. Mm -hmm. They are called thioether and mercaptanes. And you can also become allergic to them. So they are not just toxic, which adds on to your toxical burden, which your liver has to deal with. Also, you could become allergic, which means it's not dose-dependent anymore. So your whole immune system can get a long-term uh, allergy to this, which is not like the allergy you think of when, like the initial one when you get a rash or something, it's more like, yeah. a, like a type 4 immunological problem. So, and then at the end, you also have a dead organ. Just picture a dead uh, diabetic foot or toe or a black, a black finger. Yeah. To any medical doctor, they will say, whoa, that's going to cause a sepsis in your body. We have to take it off. Mm -hmm. Because the root, you don't see, and you can put a cap on top, which looks nice. Um, you cannot see from an aesthetic point of view, they leave it in your body from the strictly mechanical point of view, just biting on top of it. And it goes so far that I see panoramic x-rays with root canals with huge cysts. Like you cannot even imagine how big these cysts are. Like kind wow. of, last week I did a surgery for one cyst. It was about two cubicle centimeters big and actually almost up into the eye. Wow. The patient had no, she has no problems in terms of pain, but the dentist will ask, do you have any pain there? No. Okay, let me just monitor it. 
makes no sense because which chronic disease for your whole body does hurt? Does depression hurt? Diabetes hurt? Basically, no. Maybe at some point it will hurt because you get more sick and more sick. But this patient, for example, she was her whole system isn't working anymore. She's coming in the wheelchair in my clinic and she's only weighing 40 kilograms by 175. Wow. And she didn't even connect it there, but her, her naturopathic doctor sent her to me and said, hey, I think her mouth is a big problem. She had root canals, basically the teeth are connected. This is another point. The teeth are connected with your whole autonomic nervous system, kind of like every tooth has its own meridian. And the teeth she had was the whole gut system. It's like all the molars, it's gut, thyroid connection, and it's small intestine, large intestine. And she had, for all of them, was a tooth, that tooth with a huge cyst. So her immune system is actually pretty good, building tissues and building cysts. But imagine how much burden this is on her body to have a chronic, ongoing inflammation and activation of your immune system on a daily basis just because of this. I will, I'm very much interested in how, how she will develop, of course, with the whole pro- process. But this one was a big foundational work because this is not healthy anymore. This is also not healthy from a school medical point of view. You would need to do something. Some, yeah. There's still the concept of removing the cyst and leaving the root canal, wow. which doesn't address the root cause anyways. But, okay, we have now, now the, the, the thing we have developed is we are able to remove the root canals very gently without even touching gingiva and periodontium if it's still healthy. Take out the, just the dead stuff. We clean everything with ozone, with neural therapy, with whatever you want to name to have the perfect clean bleeding socket. And if we have the socket and everything is installed, then I'm able to place a ceramic implant, kind of like the bonus because the ceramic implant will, will then act as a tent pole and help as guided tissue and bone regeneration part. So you basically never have any, you never have any surgery besides removing this tooth very gently. So besides being a, a surgeon and the old school way of thinking as a surgeon is big surgeon, huge cuts, massive trauma. We now do even bigger surgeon, no, no cuts at all if possible and very gently tiny picky work and use timing intelligently. So we, we call that soccer preservation 3.0 or 2.0 by using stuff that's possible. So I'm very happy that all these things are there and the whole concept, I had the whole concept ready because I'm a surgeon. I'm, an implant specialist and I can do surgeries. And I was missing uh, a counterpart to a titanium implant and for a root canal back then, like when I was yeah. searching for this. That's how I found my next mentor Ulrich um, and his ceramic implants. And from this point on, the whole concept was there. So now we are able, 10 years later, to teach all the dentists because it's a full concept. We kind of built it up to that point. So I'm bringing in more the functional medicine point of view, nutrition, all these things. And Luckily, we had this ceramic implant available, so now it's really possible to do that minimal invasive. This is something we all will also plan for your case. So, <laughs> awesome. We we can talk a little bit about my case later. Uh, let's. You mentioned the word meridians, and I found that very intriguing in the book because one of the things. Uh, Dr. Dom, that you're very good at doing is pulling in influences from all over the place. And with the root canals in particular, can we talk uh, just, you touched on it briefly with the molars going to various different organs, but can we talk about how those influence meridians and may actually in fact impact our performance? Yeah, of course. It's different concepts. So, for example, just what I said, the tooth would be dead or has a mercury filling or root canal. So it is also, and this is something I've not touched on yet, is also attached to the trigeminous nerve. And what the trigeminous nerve is able to do is transport all toxins, all cytokines, whatever, into the brainstem, into ganglia, into the hypothalamus by something called retrograde axonal transport. This is something you have to know. The studies done here is 100 100 years ago almost when they just um, placed like toxic croton oil into the the cavities of, of dogs and just measured when will we find the croton oil in the hypothalamus or in the brain ganglia. So... This is just a strictly physical thing and doesn't even touch the meridians at all. But of course, this will make your whole autonomic nervous system sick. And what you also have to know from from the um, anatomy is that the trigeminus always has a little bit of a parasympathetic nervous system going with it, which, which means you can develop, it's called the toxic vagus syndrome over time, 
That means your whole parasympathetic nervous system will be blocked by all these toxins and all these cytokines and all these different problems coming from the system. Also, there will be the cadaverines and putrescines from the dead tooth also. So it's a lot of load and it's traveling like in your brainstem. And if you know how all, basically your brain is just a switching mechanism for everything that comes from your body, uh, your second brain is also the gut system. Mm -hmm. If you look at the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, you will see that it, of course, will affect the whole thing. And, and also, on top of this, the meridians is more like Chinese medicine. Every tooth has this meridian. For example, the, the first incisor is connected to your kidney and bladder system, so it will be connected to your, uh, to your neck. It will be connected to your, uh, specifically to your prostate, your male stuff down there, and your female <laughs> parts. And having problems there, so it could be that you have a chronic deck tooth in your front, and you have a cyst in your ovary for the last 30 years, and nobody finds it. And they will try to look at the cyst, but it's basically up here. This is just a meridian system. Mm -hmm. it's also kind of, you cannot say 100%, but it's kind of connected to the autonomic nervous system. So you will be in chronic in chronic stress all day long. As you see, there's so, so many points that you have to address. But another point would be that all information, so every tooth has a meridian. And this is something, what happens if you lose a tooth, for example? So how does it affect the meridian? This is a concept also, again, from Dietrich, uh, that teeth are kind of like aggregates. Or I, I can say that, aggregates for your whole autonomic nervous system. So you will bite. 15,000 times per day to activate these meridians. Mm -hmm. If you're missing a part there, tooth there, it stops. Luckily, yeah. luckily, not every tooth has only one meridian. For example, your molars, mostly two molars have one meridian, so it's mostly okay to just maybe replace one. Depends on the case. Um, but there are, uh, for example, the canines, yeah, your canines, is only liver, liver and gallbladder meridian. So if you have no canine anymore, you have some kind of like it's, it goes both ways. It goes from the teeth to your system. It goes also from your system to your teeth. So if I know that I have, have in, like the mouth is perfectly installed, and now I know that something in your mouth maybe hurts, I will always go the other way. I, I can see your mouth then as the mirror of your overall health and tell yourself, hey, man, your, your teeth are hurting now. The problem is not your teeth, man. The problem is the whole system. How about your lifestyle? Did you still go with the protein I mentioned? Yeah. Did, have you still your vitamin D3 level in check? And then most of the time, you catch the patient which left the nice lifestyle, which you're all about. So in the whole clinic, that's how we differ, is that we basically address all oral interference, have nice solutions for this when, we, when you're finally there. But we will always prepare the patient. So we, you will, like you, you, send, you will send a panoramic x-ray. I will make a planning mail. I will tell you exactly what we're going to do in order to optimize your health from, a, from the point of view of your, from the health starts in your mouth concept. Mm -hmm. You will have a nutritional design. It's the food design concept, which basically goes a little bit into ancestral ways. And it's basically my 20 years of um, trying every, every mindset out there in terms of nutrition and just um, make it as easy as possible. So the, the, the PDF is only 10 pages and it's two charts, a red one and a green one. It's a little bit generalized, but it gives an, over, uh, an, an overall idea for the patient what they have to do before. We ask for blood work like vitamin D3, LDL, just two critical markers. And we want, we want all our patients, when they're finally there with us, prepared with high vitamin D3. So it has to be above the norm, above 70, to help the bone grows, tissue grows, and uh, regeneration of teeth and to make all this happen, improve detoxification, etc. And when you're there finally, we will plan a whole health optimization week where we'll use intravenous uh, nutrition, we will use everything from the world of biohacking that we have already possible uh, to, and the whole setup of the clinic like I mentioned before is a building biologist so there's no Wi-Fi at all and you will feel very well, the whole staff is kind of like trained by me that everything is really nice and and you will have no stress at all. So we come in, we will remove, we will actually meet you for the first time. Of course, we do a full clinical examination. We do cone beam, and whatever we, we found before, we will maybe precise that there. You get uh, the metal removed. You get IVs, vitamin C, procaine, whatever we need. And then I will do the surgery at one day, if possible. Like remove all root canals, place ceramic implants, if possible. 
But the implants are only the bonus. So cleaning first, all, finding all cavitations, everything that we touch in the next challenge, and root canals so that you that you leave in parasympathetic mode. You will be, <laughs> by removing all this oral interference, we will have a big detoxification. You will have a huge load of your body in terms of immune system and toxicology, and you will have in everything installed that's biocompatible. You get another IV, another IV, we will block, draw blood to make APF membranes. There's a little bit of stem cells in there and growth factors. So everything that comes in from functional medicine we will use so that you heal as perfectly as possible, you will stay for at least three to five consecutive days after surgery so that we have time and to adjust. And I'm planning on using a little bit more of the biohacking machine soon in the clinic to, to make it even more round up. So that actually everything we do is optimizing your health and get rid of everything. What you normally go to see a dentist for like a year or so and several different appointments, we will do it in one. It's called the all-in-one concept. Mm -hmm. You can see it applies all the things, functional medicine, biohacking, and also high-tech dentistry. That's why I said at the beginning, it's more like an overlap of functional medicine, health optimization, biohacking, you name it, and high-tech dentistry. That's really important because I'm kind of doing like the, so because of the book, which I've written for the layman, mm -hmm. of course, all my training, I'm kind of in the dental field. I'm, I'm known, of course, and I'm a pioneer. And of course, there's, there's also people that don't like me, that's normal. But now we're actually able to, to make it as a whole concept and we have so many friends of mine and dentists that are finally interested. And one year after the book now, it started with a big shitstorm, but now I get like super nice um, emails from, from my colleagues. This is a good thing because the patients, they loved it from the, from the beginning. It was a yeah. selling list after one week but not my colleagues. So, but now colleagues coming in, and this is the fulfilling part also, if my colleagues finally see my friends from university, they always said, oh Dom, you with your food, your nutrition, you're the guy that brings his food within and stuff, you're just crazy. And now they're seeing, finally seeing it. And this is something that, that we have to multiply on the world because I'm only able to maybe do a thousand, uh, let's say 30,000 surgery in my career. This, mm -hmm. is, this is nothing. But if you train a thousand dentists, or not even dentists, just people that are interested in overall health with this whole concept, you can help 30 million people. You can really have an impact in terms of um, the next, Yo. which is optimal health, which goes contrary to, of course, just absence of disease, which is not so interesting, but maybe to be. No, it, it's, it's not very interesting uh, to go with the absence of disease as sort of the model for health. But, uh, you know, this is fantastic, Dr. Dom. Now, one area I think we're gravitating towards is something that I experienced. It's very common, actually, in the States. At the age of 18, before you go off to college, you get your wisdom teeth removed. Um, I didn't actually know what was going on. I didn't know if I actually had a problem or if they're impacted, et cetera. They just all got removed. And very, very painful surgery where you go in the hospital, you actually remain there overnight. In some cases, you end up vomiting a few times. What's the issues uh, with getting my wisdom teeth removed, aside from the fact that it basically reset my, my jawline a little bit and I may need braces again? Yeah, the wisdom tooth con removal concept is, if you look at a studies from Western Price, um, it's a problem of our Western lives and maybe the whole diet part, etc. I don't want to go too deep into it. Let's just focus on the actual surgery. Same here, actually. So I was 14 years old. My dad told me you have to get your wisdom teeth removed. He didn't even do it because he didn't want to do it on his son. I don't know. <laughs> Just remember, like you said, like was randomly went into a clinic, kind of like placed there, got some anesthesia, huge trauma. Like one minute later, I looked like Rocky Balboa and I couldn't yeah. eat. And I knew because back then I didn't have any lifestyle. I was a skater. So I was probably smoking on two days later again. So it got inflamed afterwards. I didn't prepare myself like we do that. So basically, they caught me in hibernation mode, like vitamin D3, probably critical low, and my lifestyle was eating McDonald's all day long and maybe one good meal that my mom cooked. But besides that, just convenient stuffing everything that's sugar and stuff into me. I, I would probably drink three liters of soda every day. Just no problem because I was skateboarding anyways. I was probably burning through this, but for my system, not a good idea. Mm -hmm. So this is how normally... And also, of course, I was still growing when you're 14. You're like in puberty. Yeah. Massive trauma. And 
basically what it ha what happens is it's just your body's just not able to heal it uh, because you're not prepared and it's just too big of a surgery trauma and maybe it wasn't even necessary i don't know what and it's also on top of that this area the wisdom tooth area from chinese medicine meridian point of view is connected to the small intestine the heart meridian and the triple bone which is basically your adrenal glands mm -hmm. Two interfering with a kid that's growing which on the other side can lead to a problem in these areas because you didn't develop the whole body because of the surgery. Can you understand that? Mm -hmm. So it's just too early to remove them. Maybe you have to remove it. So it's, it's already pathologic that you maybe have an impacted wisdom tooth. So I had impacted wisdom tooth. So at one point, you probably should have removed them. And they did it because of, like you said, because of braces and stuff so that my, my teeth wouldn't crowd themselves again. Um, but it will leave your body and I didn't know that back then, with something called cavitations. Yeah. And about, I would say in about 99% of all cases, that's the case. So you can end up having the perfect panoramic x-ray, still being chronic tired, or having the opposite, being a little bit nervous and having skin problems, small intestinal problems, like digestive issue problems, IBS, etc., because you're having these so-called, in layman's term, cavitations. That's totally wrong. Cavitations, um, the, the better wording, like more medical point of view, would be FDOJ in English, which means fatty degenerative osteonegrotic jawbone. Wow, say that five times fast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you could also call it CIBD, chronic ischemic bone disease. That's where you find some literature. Mm -hmm. Actually, a German guy, a friend of mine, Dr. Johann Lechner, He's done, he basically devoted his whole life. He's now 70 years old. He's also a friend of Dietrich. They all know each other in the field. Um, Dr. Johann Lechner, he wrote three books and has 10 peer-reviewed uh, studies. And he's still, it's still not accepted medically, even if there's so much information. And he basically devoted his whole life to this research. And I think it's finally time that it will come. And, but you have to notice because you have the perfect panoramic x-ray, but you had your wisdom tooth removed and you could be chronic sick because of this. Because cavitations, if you see them on a cone beam then, it's just basically an osteolytic process, means, means the sponge is bony structure, which is kind of like, looks like the bee, the bee net, or like where bees live. Like mm -hmm. What the word is, the bee, where do bees live? Uh, the beehive. Yeah, the beehive, you know how it looks like these, mm -hmm. kind of like, that's how natural bone should look like. It's called sponges, or like a sponge. And on a cone beam, you would see just basically, basically black, a black area. And I know because I've also did more than 3,000 cavitation surgeries already over the last 10 years, how it presents clinically when you open this. And it's normally super fatty. There is no bone at all. It's, it looks really nasty. Oh. Can imagine there's a little bit of like necrotic bone, which is just bone particles lying in there. And it can be as big as a tooth or even bigger, like one, I would say regular is about one cubic centimeter, even one to two to three cubic centimeters. Wow. What he found out, Dr. Lechner, over time is, because he did so much research there, it's kind of like a huge dumping area. Your body initially is not able to heal it because you're not prepared for surgery. It's just a big, too big of a trauma. You're a kid, you're missing vitamin D3, all the minerals, you have a wrong diet, no protein, etc. Initially, it's just not not healing but then of course again it's a cave so we will find viruses parasites fungi basically everything in there even heavy metals they found and glyphosates whatever you name it and the problem is it's again sometimes even surrounding the trigeminous nerve imagine if your trigeminous nerve now is chronically inflamed because of the chronic inflammation surrounding it transporting all these different toxins and viruses into your brain imagine just this this could be a problem right Mm -hmm. of course makes you chronically sick so you could open the clinic by just addressing this and you will have you will be like a witch doctor because you help actually heal the patient a little bit because you're just basically taking out the, the garbage taking out the trash taking out the oral interference you're preparing the patient well and your body is just able to heal itself so what we do is just helping your body heal itself that's actually what we do and now have to inform the whole um yeah, everybody that this problem actually exists or that this could be a thing. And, you know, a lot of people are chronic, chronically tired. Yeah. This is one of the main suspects. All they have autonomic, uh, like, autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. Intestinal problems. So me personally, I was on the search for optimal health since I'm 16 years old. And I found a lot of things. And But still, let's say about six years ago, seven years ago, 
I would have current rashes in my face and my diet was on lock. So I would say no inflammatory foods, best possible quality, but still this inflammation. And whenever I eat something tiny little bit wrong, my whole gut would blow up and I like, had this pressure in my back and everything would hurt for days and was super cramped, grinding all night. And I was a little bit like this already. I'm, of course, you may see I'm having a lot of energy anyways. And I would be probably an ADHS kid nowadays. <laughs> you and me both. The hunter. Um, but besides that, I was, a little, I was a little bit of afraid of getting something like Parkinson's or stuff like this. And then the guy was there when we did surgery. He was there to, to shadow us. And he said, okay, let's test this, like muscle testing. And as I told you, I'm also trained by Didrik, so muscle testing is fine for me, like the ART. So he tested me and said, okay, there's some stress going on. You must have another oral interference. Let's do a cone beam. And I was already doing cavitation surgeries, but I didn't know, didn't know all the stuff I just explained to you. I thought it's a random thing that happens. You maybe have a cavitation. I didn't know where it comes from. So we did a cone beam and found huge cavitations on my body. And then, it, and then it clicked and I was like, whoa, we have to do surgery as fast as possible. I want to see what happens. So, of course, my lifestyle was okay, and, but we didn't prepare surgery how we do it now for patients. So I was basically also just at the end of the day, lying there in the chair at 7 p.m. after 12 hours of work. And we did only one side, and, and Ulrich, who did the surgery, he was like, whoa, it's so, so nasty what you find in there. And even if I wasn't prepared, I was on the chair feeling that the, the block in my stomach, it was kind of like more in my back, my back pain. I knew that I had a back pain from my stomach because it was only in stress. Yeah. It just disappeared and I had to laugh. I was like, is that even possible? Is this just something I'm imagining here right now? And this super shakiness that I had in the morning, like this overly um, uh, extreme nervous system, was it was gone on the next day. And we only did one side. Of course, I got a huge swelling because on the next day I was working 14 hours doing surgery with one ice bag in the hand and the other way. So I didn't do stuff I would now tell my patients. But still, I had this massive healing and of course, I wanted to do my other side as soon as possible because my face was still inflamed. Mm -hmm. So let's say four weeks later, we did the other side. And two weeks after this, I was a model for skin cream. So my nice. face was perfect. Everything was gone. And then you, are, then you again have this knowledge learned by yourself and you have the moral obligation. Of course, the surgeon, my, my, my other mentor, Uri Fosset, he also wanted his surgery then. And from there on, we integrated because he, had, he also had massive healing afterwards for stuff that he couldn't address with everything he tried. He wasn't able to address that problem. And just this tiny surgery, which is not really invasive, um, helped him heal so much. So we integrated that to our concept years ago. And then, of course, we, fi we fine-tuned the concept, used new things that, are able, that, that will help us. So, so everything that's possible to even make it heal better. So nowadays, we're able to remove wisdom teeth or whatever, but the whole protocol, like how to optimize the patient's health so that you're yeah. actually able to heal it because the surgery in itself is not a big deal. If you know how to do that minimal invasive, we use pizza surgery, use ozone to clean everything, a lot of it. We use the membranes, we spin our, our, the blood and make, I told you already, the plasma membranes, kind of like yeah. PRP, a little bit different spinning protocol. It mm -hmm. contains 1.2% of stem cells, uh, growth factors, we replace it all there. And of course we do as minimal invasive cuts as possible. But with the whole concept around and the fine tuning of your body, your body is just able to heal itself so good. So yeah. swelling after surgery is so tiny, a little bit of pain. We will manage it with a little bit of pain medication maybe or even whatever you want to use to that. And this is the goal here. I don't want to have any Rocky Balboa face sitting in my waiting room. I want to have yeah. this. I, I actually just do everything for my patients, how I would like to have it on my body. That's it. So I, I'm also the guy who I did the surgery for my dad, for my mom, for my brother, for my sister, for my wife, for everybody. I don't see any difference in any patient. I don't even care which insurance you have. You come to me, it's kind of like my moral obligation or my challenge to give you next level health. But yes. also in return, I want the maximum commitment of you because it's something I cannot train. It's something you have to bring in. And then then you will have the awesome results. This is fulfilling as hell. Yeah. Yeah. Tim would say it's fulfilling AF. <laughs> yeah, I, I may use the AF acronym from time to time as well. Uh, this 
Yeah, he's um he's shared a few stories with me about it, and he said, it, I mean, overall, it's just been a fantastic experience w- for him. And I know we've got me slotted to come down there pretty soon. So, um, you know, Doctor Dome, I, I would love to just touch base on a couple of other points that were more questions from the listeners, and it just looking at some bit more. Uh, we've touched on some really fantastic topics here, but there's some very basic questions that people have. Like, for instance, uh, the F word fluoride, uh, should we be using it? Should we not be using it? And then toothpaste in general, how often should we be brushing? So that is, it depends, again, on your lifestyle. Yeah. But just as a general rule of thumb, I would go with the two times a day brushing. I don't use fluoride. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I don't emphasize anybody to use fluoride because it's just having any problem with you in your tools, like a cavity or something, it's not a, ca- a deficiency of chemicals in your body. It's maybe a deficiency of minerals in your body or overall proteins and stuff. So I would always address it like this. Mm-hmm. Maybe there is a case for like, like, I don't even see these patients, but if you like, it's called like an oral pick, we would say, like, who's like really nasty. Everything is full of metals. You have like, you need it maybe, no, in my opinion, you don't even need it then. So let's just go with, fluoride is not necessary, yeah? Okay. And I personally only brush my teeth once a day, which caught the attention of all the media in Germany last year. But I can only give you that advice if you're already optimized. If your lifestyle is on point, you don't even, so the stuff I eat, it's more like everything you can hunt, you can fish, you can, like basically kind of like a paleo, I call it macronutrient timing, food design, because it's a little different. Mm-hmm. I don't even get any biofilm of fur. So I just brush my teeth basically to not smell. Yeah. Something. Yeah. There is no, there, it's always clean. Uh, and um, then you should use a soft brush and more be gentle. Don't like rub extremely and grind your teeth off. You shouldn't, in my opinion, don't use anything that is, that uses particles that makes it more white because mostly it's kind of like a grip tape. Which uh, grips not, or which uh, I don't know the word in English here, which. Um, it's like sandpaper, it kind of pulls stuff off. Yeah, it's kind of like sandpaper, and of course it will um, pull a little bit of your teeth off over time. Mm-hmm. Your teeth should be hard as stone. They're in the category or category of uh, granite. It's, uh, in Germany at least, it's category five, so it's super hard. Yeah. And your body is able to do that from the inside. Whatever you eat and assimilate, minerals, vitamin D3, etc. your body will be able to uptake it and build bone and teeth. It's kind of like the same structure. So if you have all minerals and everything installed, then you have teeth hard as stone. And at the same time, that's amazing, actually, these organs can feel a hair. So they're super sensitive and super hard at the time. So it's, wow. it's really a crazy thing. And the saliva in, in, your, in your mouth is this awesome liquid, basically, or this awesome electrolyte which of course could be not awesome if your lifestyle is wrong, but if your lifestyle is perfect, there's the immune system, your whole digestion starts, there all the digestive enzymes already in your saliva, and it also protects your tooth by building this thing called pedicle, which kind of like attaches itself. You know the movie Venom, how Venom, yeah. that's how I imagine the pedicle. It's like, <laughs> and it just, you know, and it's kind of this tiny little fluid, which it's kind of like a huge net or Spider-Man net, that goes over your tooth to protect itself. And then it pulls proteins and minerals. And the saliva, saliva is very tightly um, controlled. So there's this calcium, phosphorus, and mineral um, equilibrium maybe, or balance, mm-hmm. depending again on, on your whole eating protocol. So if you, for example, do the standard American diet or standard German diet, it's the same, um, with loads of blood sugar spikes and, and lots of sugars and stuff, it will be different than if you have an ancestral lifestyle that doesn't have any big insulin um, or sp- blood sugar spikes and insulin things and leptin because leptin maybe maybe also blocks uh, enzymes and re- receptors. Yeah. You will have a total different one. This is why I'm always training the patients or everybody with the food protocol, the food first. And this is actually what how I started. So before university. I was interested at civil service because I wasn't as healthy as I wanted to be. That's why I didn't make it as a professional skater. Maybe I had the talent, maybe also had the drive for this. Didn't have the environment, but I was too sick all the time. So I always, mm-hmm. and of course the lifestyle. But when I started 
working out because I want to just look muscular. Like every 18 year old, I wanted to look like a turtle, like an uh, action figure. Mm -hmm. Aesthetically driven, I went to the gym and of course the performance of skateboarding, jumping high or whatever. And I found a book that uh, it was a, probably was a Flex magazine, and on top, uh, so the title was "Eat 3,000 Calories a Day to Gain Muscle." And I was like, "What is a calorie? I don't even know what that is." <laughs> I was already 20 years old, so 20 years old, I didn't know what a calorie was. So basically, nutrition and lifestyle wasn't in my in my focus. I just did what everybody did, but then I ate calories. So I just ate noodles, yeah, and tuna fish. Because I thought, okay, I get this kind of protein, and there's a lot of calories in the noodles, so I probably eat a year, and I gained 20 kilograms, but uh, probably not as healthy as I should have been. Mm. So over the time, because of all these experiments on my body, I was able to see that health should be top priority, not aesthetics and stuff. Took yeah. me a while to figure all this out. Now I know, and I had so many health challenges on the way that I took as a challenge. And basically learn from this. And now I can use all these things. But diet is really a foundational part here in my in my field. And um, that's why this is always foundation. It's like nutrients, macronutrients. It's like the protein, the enzymes from the protein that are built up. If you there's just studies showing you when we when we get to bone and teeth again. So teeth can build rebuild themselves. So mm -hmm. when you go to the dentist, you will have maybe an X-ray and you see this little tiny initial cavity. You would say. Then the dentist decides, hmm, you want to drill or not? And then maybe you say as a patient, oh, I, want to, I don't want to drill, let's just monitor it. Yeah. But from my point of view, I would never drill it. I would explain to you, okay, this is a mineral deficiency. It's kind of like osteoporosis of you. Yeah. And let's go with your lifestyle design here. How is your protein look, et cetera? How is your vitamin D3 level? What about the minerals? Because we know that we need vitamin D3 to get calcium in your bloodstream, and then we need vitamin K2 and magnesium as cofactors to bring it up into your bone, to your teeth. It's the same thing. But if you have a lack of protein in the first place or amino acids, um, you don't have, you're not having the enzymes to build it. So basically, mm -hmm. food comes first. And there's a study, the osteoporotic osteoporosis study, the framing and osteoporosis study that shows um, people that are just, so they go with one gram per kilogram of protein kind of like it's a critical low dose. If you go below one gram, it could be that you have 30 days longer hospitalization after a fracture of your hip or of your, of your bone here. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you go um, above one gram, it's way faster the healing. And of course, the bone density and, and everything. The same applies, of course, for your, the bone in, in your, in your tooth, uh, around your tooth and your tooth itself. So the turnover rate of everything that grows in your body could become... 30 days or three days, depending on what you feed your body. So that's why I always give, when you're there at surgery day, at the end, I will always sit down with you personally and individualize your plan on how you look. So I can see if your metabolic problems is a thing and we have to maybe start with an initial ketogenic elimination diet. Or you maybe have some kind of mindset, you being maybe a vegan, but don't know how that works perfectly. So I'm just able to um, optimize your vegan lifestyle because I don't care if you want to be a vegan, it's fine, but you still have, have to cover bases. Uh, like, and, yeah. and that's basically what I'm there for. I will do that 10, 15 minutes. And then, of course, I have everything with the other company I've built up for the last five years with the uh, supplements, etc. And I dialed in because of all these things I had to learn on my body because all these chronic patients kind of overlap also with what they have. So they have the problem with the SNPs. So one my, one of my things when I was 22 years old, I was crashed a little bit and I didn't know what to do and found out over time that I'm that I'm just having a neurotransmitter problem here. So I'm yeah. a dopamine, I'm a dopamine dominant person, mm -hmm. acetylcholine, kind of like an athlete. Yeah, I'm an acetylcholine dominant person, so I, I know what that's like. But I wasn't feeling so good, yeah. So I wasn't normal anymore. But it took me a while to figure out the Eric Braverman test. Found that one. And found out, oh, okay, you're dopamine dominant, I have a deficiency in the dopamine. So then from my studies in biochemistry, it was so easy to use supplements and build my brain structure. And I also have these SNPs. I, I'm, I'm a, a, what is it in English? Heterozygitis probably. Yeah, heterozygous, yeah. Ethylation. So I need to have a focus there. And of course, we all have, like with the chronic inflammations and stuff in your body, we all have a, a vitamin D3 receptor deficiency. SNPs are both be the same. And also had a huge head and neck trauma, which led to something called cryptopyroluria. Wow. So all the, yeah, I had neck trauma was massive and I was faulting snowboarding. So I kind of ripped my head off. And this is a big 
thing, but we cannot go into this rabbit hole now. <laughs> we'll save it for the next one. Yeah, head and neck is extreme. And also C1 to C4 is directly connected to all oral interference. <laughs> it's extreme. And this is why this is all installed into this protocol. So basically designing it for me and for all patients to get them to the next level. So you see, it's a lot of different things. Now you maybe see why, why they called me. Like last year, I didn't know what the word biohacking was. So there was a patient coming in from New York. So 50% of all my patients coming from all over the world, at least. She came from New York. She has nice shops there. And she told me after like this week with me, you kind of like um, Tom Bilyeu and Dave Asprey in one person in Germany. And I wasn't even, I didn't even know who Tom Bilyeu was and I didn't mm -hmm. know who Dave Asprey was. Now I know, of course, and about a week later, I was invited for, to give a podcast interview for the German biohacking community, which is Flow Great. Maybe you heard of that? Yeah, and Max is a good friend. Yeah, Max interviewed me and like 10 minutes into the interview, he said, dude, you like the, a huge biohacker because you do that for 20 years. And I didn't even know about the word and what biohacking was. So when Tim said health optimization, that little bit uh, applied to me more. But nowadays, I also like the biohacking because that's what the cool kids do. Yeah. <laughs> a skater would rather biohack than optimize the health. You know what I mean? Exactly. The the skateboarder inside of us gets a, comes back. It's it's like that old adage, you can't take the skateboard out of the kid. You can take the skateboard away from the kid, but you can't take the skater out of the kid. I may have butchered that one, but... Uh, yeah, it's a good one. A goal of mine was, with all the chronic problems I had, I just wanted to become 14 again because I knew how I was when I was a kid and it's kind of like I'm now. I'm just mm -hmm. free every day. Like you said at the beginning of our interview, it's just to have fun. Yeah. People that are like-minded, that have the same mission, just helping as many people as possible getting healthy again, don't, don't push their egos too much, but just, you can find all my information for free. It's all there. I give you everything. That's fine. It's just it's more like an inner calling because it helped me so much. And I think we should all align. That's why I call it the wolf pack. You know, like um, all the good people that talk about it and then we can change. That's an amazing thing. I like it. I like it. One last, one last question before we switch over to the final rapid fire ones. Mouthwash. Is it useful? Should we, should we table it? How, what should I do with mouthwash? So I would say a chemical mouthwash, I would skip it right away. Okay. Throw it in the trash because it's shown that, for example, um, chlor chlorhexidine, it's probably also in English. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This activates um, enzymes that are actually killing your, your system here or like disrupting the gingiva and the attached gingiva. I wouldn't use it. What I would do as a mouthwash, if you need it, or as a, as a substitute maybe, you've heard of the concept of oil pulling, yeah. yeah, using Ayurvedic treatments. So if you use anything from nature, also different herbs and stuff, that's a good idea. Yeah, like brush your teeth, make it, uh, make your gingiva healthy, supply the right nutrients. And oil pulling, I would normally say just use an extra virgin coconut oil because it tastes good, and also coconut oil in itself because of the different fatty structures is antibacterial, antiviral, etc. So you will just put oil into your mouth and swish it gently around for about five minutes. You can also go 15 minutes, whatever. And it will um, attract all these um, fat-soluble toxins and, of course, also kills bacteria. Don't swallow it. Spit it out. That's basically the concept. And it will help your immune system, of course. This has been absolutely amazing, Dr. Dom. I can't thank you enough for taking the time. I just want to transition now into our last uh, final set of rapid fire questions that I ask everybody. And the first one is, how do you unwind? <laughs> yeah, this has uh, been a bit of a challenge for me. So basically nowadays, because I don't even, everything I do is fun for me. So I have a big team, like I, in my clinic, I have, 20 people working with me in the juicery. I have another five. So I have about a staff of 30 to 40 people and they all love their jobs. So I can take away a few things. And me personally, I love to yeah, just hang with my family and I try to have 50% of my time or my net time with family, friends and, and stuff. So I think this is more relaxing, but also mm, everything I do is no stress for me. So I don't, of course, I'm maybe pushing the cortisol a little bit because I'm a, I like that. But it's just if you look at my, my cortisol, it's maybe a little bit higher. But that's just me generally. So it's not that my salivary is wrong. 
just high in the morning. And everything that I don't like, I, I skip right away or find somebody who likes it actually. And as this thing is a mission, I would say there is no, no such thing as work-life balance. It's more yeah. like if you do what you love, then you just do it. For me, it's more like if I don't do things and just sit around, I'm not the type of person who can sit still too much. For example, I have to I work out or, or gym is my happy place nowadays because I don't have so much time to go and do skateboarding and stuff. So mm-hmm. when I go in the gym, it, I go morning, 5.30 in the morning, or I wake up and I go straight to the gym, and there's nobody. It's just me, and I most of the time I even close my eyes and just feel everything. It's more like everything I do is basically just for feeling that I have installed, that I like, how my body should feel. And I, of course, I'm the guy who measures everything, like you, I wear an aura ring, I do the mm-hmm. HP, um, because I would be the person that smashes it and don't think about it. I would probably not look at the recovery part too much. <laughs> but now I have to learn that, so I will biohack my way around it. So, But this is my family, my friends. I love to hang with family and friends and having a good time. And actually, if I can make that, that my patients are also my friends and family, kind of, everybody I'm hanging around with should be a friend. Or, for example, Tim. I met Tim. He invited me to the Health Optimization Summit. We didn't even meet. We didn't even see us. Just one fist bump. And, but then because of his own case, he came into Germany and we hang out, we hung out all day long and, and talked. And of course we also did a little bit of surgery for him and everything. And this is what I'm all about. Like finding like-minded people. Basically that's the same thing I did as a skateboarder. So I pushed it so hard because I just like it. And I'm like, an, it's just the mindset of giving everything. Like mm-hmm. want to become a little bit better every day. Maybe I was a perfectionist at one point. But uh, this is gone. So now it's just like getting a little bit bigger, better every day, growth and contribution part of you. And then find people that are exactly like the same frequency and try to push it themselves and just having fun with it. And Tim is exactly yeah. this guy. Eh? That's why we uh, went, went, went oh, yeah, what do you say? That's why we got along so awesomely and um, yeah, and pushing it and speaking about everything. And this is, it's not work for me. You know what I mean? It's not yeah. really, but of course, it can become too much. I have to be a little bit picky about my time nowadays because a lot of people wanted to do something with me and I have to really see, okay, is this something that makes sense? Is it aligning with the mission? And yeah, of course, I have my kids and my wife. Yeah. Ich brauche noch fünf Minuten. Ich brauche noch fünf Minuten. Yeah. And that's my wife calling. <laughs> Got to get back to the family. I want to have, yeah, there were times before my son was born, I did this thing called flying implant service where, where you could just book me. I would go to Paracelsus clinic, don't even know the nurses, not even the patients for sure, don't even the case. I just went in there with my stuff and did full day surgery. So it was like 12, 13 hour days, 14 hour days. And my son was born. I was like, Fuck, I don't even see this guy. Yeah. So that's when my mindset switched and I, and I kind of visioned what I wanted to do in my life. And one thing is I'm a big family man. I want to hang, I want to hang with my with my wife and with my three sons. So I have now I have Max. He's five. Carl will be three in in a month. And uh, Louis was just born. He's only like ten weeks old. So I need this time. So everything is structured around this. So when I wake up in the morning, I might go to pull in the the workout when they still asleep. Of course, I know it would be better to do that over like like at daytime, just from a health optimization point of view. But of course, then it will. But the hours will be away from my family. Yeah. So play space, hang with my wife. My wife is my wife, or my, my girlfriend, since I'm 21 years old. So she's there for 15, almost 16 years. Kind of like my soulmate, uh, partner in crime, best friend, all in one. So I have to have time for this too. And I make it 50%. That's why I'm very structured with everything I do. So I go in the clinic. They that start at 8. I go in 9.30 and do full day surgery without any breaks. I do a little bit of break to maybe drink a shake or eat something, but basically compact everything to make it as efficient, as effective as possible to have everything so that everything is fun. Because of course, also surgeries, if you do too much, can become not fun anymore. So it's all about micro refinements of your lifestyle design, whatever you want to call it. It's amazing. Dr. Dom, I know you have to go. Your family's calling you, uh, but also you've been very generous with your time. Where can people find out more about you? And I know the book 
It's coming out in English very soon. Where can people find the book? The book is on every platform available, of course, on Amazon, Barnes, etc. And it's it's going to be called It's All in Your Mouth, the English version. It's also coming out in China and in French Canada, so it's awesome. That never happens with German books. Um, it's amazing, so I'm kind of proud of this. You can find me on our web page. Maybe you have it in the show notes. It's, yeah. the, it's the aesthetics, it's the dental part. Um, then you can find me with my on my Instagram, which is at drdom1. You probably add it um, in the show notes. Of course. And YouTube. There's also a YouTube channel. You can find me everywhere because I try to push the information. And, and as you hinted, we'll link to all of this at the show notes, which are at decodingsuperhuman.com slash drdom. That's D-O-M-E. Dr. Dome, this has been amazing. I can't wait to come down to Germany and get my my whole mouth resituated, but this has been incredible. Thank you for taking the time. Yeah, 100%. Thank you very much for having me. It was, yeah, it was awesome. To all the superhumans listening out there, have an absolutely epic day. All right, superhumans. So let's talk about some of the things that I got out of that episode because it was the first deep dive we'd done into the oral microbiome. Dr. Dominic Nischwitz talked a little bit about some of the things that I took as gospel growing up are really not something that we should just do without questioning. For instance, getting your wisdom teeth removed when you're 18. And so... Among other things on my to-do list, I will be getting my wisdom teeth re-looked at, but also I just want you guys to share with me what you learned. Take a picture of the podcast episode, write down a quote, share it on the socials, tag Decoding Superhuman. I would love to hear what you got out of it. And if you really, really enjoyed the episode, head on over to iTunes because as you heard earlier, I'm reading all the reviews. And so I'd love to read yours on the air. So just leave a review with five stars and it really, really helps get the word out. The show notes for this one, as well as links to Dr. Dom's book and so many other things are at decodingsuperhuman.com slash Dr. Dom. That's D-O-M-E. So D-R-D-O-M-E. Superhumans, you are epic. I appreciate you. Have an epic day. Choose health.